case control and cohort studies, they're very similar, but case control and cohort studies have got some important differences. They've got strengths, they've got weaknesses. We're gonna talk about that today, so stick with me. So both case control and cohort studies have similar objectives. In other words, they both want to understand the relationship between exposure and outcome. Now, exposures can be good or bad, right? It could be tobacco smoke that you're exposed to at some point in time, or it could be a health intervention or medicine. Over time, that could translate into good or bad outcomes, right? Getting cancer or improving your health outcome, for example. So let's start by talking about case control studies, right? Case control studies start off by collecting cases, people that have some kind of outcome of interest. And interestingly, it can be a rare outcome, which is one of the strengths of case control studies. So we gather together the cases. We also want a group of controls. In other words, people that don't have that outcome. We gather them together as well. And we ask both groups of people about their history. What might they have been exposed to in the past? And we want to know if there's a difference, if their exposure, if their history of exposure is different, and might that explain the difference in outcome that we're seeing today. Now, with respect to these two groups, the cases and controls, we want them to be as similar to each other as possible, with the exception of the fact that they've got a different outcome, right? The cases have an outcome of interest, and the, and the control group doesn't have that outcome of interest. And the reason we want them to be similar is so that we can compare them. Keep in mind that it is difficult if not impossible to guarantee that these two groups are in actual fact similar in every single way except for the fact that they have this different outcome and that's one of the weaknesses of case control studies and we'll talk about that in just a minute and just so that you know this channel is sponsored by nested knowledge that's a platform that supports systematic literature review and meta-analysis they're absolutely amazing check out the link in the description below so let's say for example we identified a very rare kind of cancer and this is actually one of the strengths of case control studies is that you can use them to do a study around a very rare outcome right so let's say that there's a rare kind of cancer there's not many people that have this we can find those people because we can look at hospital records so we can identify that group and we might ask the question uh, and then we create a, a, a control group and we ask the question is there an, a different in their exposure and we look at their histories and we identify that the rare form of cancer that group have almost all of them were smokers and the control group most of them weren't smokers and that provides us with a sense that provides us with evidence of what we call a correlation doesn't mean causation so keep in mind there's a difference between correlation there's a relationship between these two factors the exposure and the outcome but it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a causative relationship and the reason I say that is because of this thing called confounding. Confounding is the biggest weakness when it comes to these sorts of studies. It's the thing we have to think about all of the time. Confounding is an alternative explanation for what seems to be a causative relationship between an exposure and an outcome. Let's look at a few things that we now know about case control studies from this example. Firstly, they're retrospective. Right? which means you can do the entire study now. You can take the history now. You can do the analysis now. They don't take years and years and years to do. And that means that they're quick, firstly, obviously, and they're cheap, right? And that's important. You don't need a huge budget to do a case control study. When we do a cohort study, our starting point is the exposure of interest, right? So we've got a cohort of people. They've been exposed to something of interest. We've collected that data and we follow them over time. And by the way, it could be a long time, right? And we're gonna come back to that. We follow them over time and we collect data about the extent to which outcomes of interest emerge in that group of people. And then of course, in the analysis, we're gonna compare people that were exposed to whatever the exposure of interest is. We're gonna compare them to people that were not exposed to that exposure, that hazard or that health intervention or whatever it is that we're looking at. And we will see the extent to which the two groups are different in terms of the outcome of interest or outcomes of interest. Interestingly, you can have multiple outcomes of interest and I'm gonna to come to that in just a second. So for example, there might be people that are drinking water from a water source and in that water source, there's a particular mineral and we don't know what that mineral is gonna do. So we follow that group of people over time, okay? And we collect data about what happens in terms of their health outcomes and we compare them to people that drank water from a different source with that particular mineral or hazard or whatever it is that we're looking at that, that, that wasn't in the water in, in this group and we compare the outcomes of these two groups, all right? Now, what's important about this is that you can consider rare exposures. In other words, you could find just a few people of, you know, there might just be a handful of people all over, from all over the world who in actual fact are drinking water with that particular mineral in it, right? So you can find very rare exposures and follow, follow them over time and have a look at the outcomes, right? So rare exposures. The other thing that's important here 
He said you can look at multiple outcomes, right? Multiple possible outcomes. You can look at the extent to which this particular particular mineral made their hair grow faster, or the height of the people, or the cancer that emerged in this group of people. Multiple exp- multiple outcomes, rare exposures, right? And and the point that I'm making here is to compare it to case control studies, where our starting point was the outcome of interest, so we could have rare outcomes of interest and look back at multiple possible exposures, right? So in a in a cohort study, we can look at rare exposures and look for multiple possible outcomes. Okay, an important difference. And then, of course, just to state the obvious, because this is prospective, okay, you're doing it over time, it takes a long time to do. You, could, you might have to follow this group up over years and years. And because it takes a long time to do, they are not cheap at all. These things are expensive to do. Now, the good thing about a cohort study is that it does provide stronger evidence than a case control study. Now, it's not as strong evidence as you would get from a randomized control trial, right? But keep in mind, there are some things for which you can't do a randomized control trial. A randomized control trial requires of you to actually intervene, to take one branch of your trial and, and, inter- and, and impose some sort of exposure onto them. And for ethical reasons, there's a lot of things for which you just couldn't do that, right? With respect to a cohort study, there might be people that have already been exposed to something, right? So you're not doing it to them. It's happened, and you can follow them over time, no big ethical concerns, and you can look for data. You can look for this correlation between exposure and outcome. Okay, a quick summary. Case control studies, they're retrospective, which means that they are quick to do. It also means that they're cheap to do, right? Because we're starting with the outcome of interest, we can look at rare outcomes and we can look back at multiple exposures. It doesn't provide terribly strong evidence. Cohort studies, by contrast, prospective, right? Which means they take a long time to do, which means they are expensive. Our starting point is the exposure, so we can look for rare exposures and we can look over time at multiple possible outcomes. The evidence that they provide is considered to be stronger. Now, I've created a cheat sheet that gives you a summary of different study designs and their strengths and weaknesses, etc., etc., and it goes into much more than just cohort and case control studies. If you would like to download for free my cheat sheet, click on the link on the screen right now. You can download it for free, no strings attached. Hope you enjoyed this video. 